left off yesterday, I think. Um, as we were trying to finish up class, I had just begun talking about recovery, which Tolkien in that paragraph where he introduces it, <clears throat> where he introduces it, says, which includes return and renewal of health. Okay? And then he goes on and, okay, now keep in mind, first of all, who that's meant for. It's not a return and renewal of health of somebody in the store. It's that's us as readers, okay? Or whoever is reading fairy stories. Because keep in mind, he says, fairy stories offer in, in a peculiar degree or mode these four things to the readers of them. Fantasy, recovery, escape, and consolation. So he says, recovery, which includes return and renewal of health, is a regaining, a regaining of a clear view. I do not say seeing things as they are, I involve myself with the philosophers, you know, because philosophers want to say, well, what are things really? What are they? You know, he doesn't want to go there. Though I might venture, to, might venture to say, seeing things as we are or were meant to see them. And then he explains what he means by that. As apart from ourselves. Okay? Because we tend to appropriate things. Okay? So he says, we need, in any case, to clean our windows so that the things seen clearly may be freed from the drab blur of triteness or familiarity, from possessiveness. All right? This triteness is really the penalty of appropriation. The things that are trite, or in a bad sense familiar, are the things that we have appropriated legally or mentally. That is, whether or not, you know, because I purchased this, it's mine. But even more than that, mentally, this idea of appropriating things. For example, I don't know that Tolkien would use this, but I will. You know, I, I talked about yesterday, you know, looking out a window and seeing a tree. Well, mentally, we know what a tree is. Mentally, we know what a flower is. We know what a sunset is, what a rainbow, you know, all those kinds of things. And because we know what it is, because we've seen them before, it's like we look, we glance, we see, we identify, we name, we categorize. We shuffle it off, shuffle it off into some little portion of our brain so that we don't really pay any attention to it. That's what Tolkien's saying we've got to get out of the habit of doing. We've got to get out of the habit of merely categorizing and see, as it were, seeing whatever it is we're looking at as if we've never seen it before. Okay? So that when you do see something that you've never seen before or something that you've never um, seen in this way before, most of us, when we see something like that, we're like, whoa, or wow, or we're amazed, we're full of awe. That's what Tolkien's getting at. That's how... Fairy stories should help us to see the world. How? How can they do that? I mean, he doesn't tell us how. He's expecting us as readers to understand what he's getting at. <clears throat> so how does it work? I'll give it a shot. <clears throat> um, by <clears throat> presenting a world that is similar to, yet in certain important ways, different from our own, when we perceive the differentness in this created world, or sub as he would say, sub-created sub world, um, we carry that experience of the differentness of the world of fairy into our primary reality, so that the tree we perceive in what we're going to call real life, we see not so much through the lens, but through the cleansing experience of having perceived this tree in the sub-created world. Exactly. Exactly. Use another example. You, you know, remember what he said in that, that quotation I had on the board? Creative fantasy is founded upon the hard recognition that things are so in the world as it appears under the sun. Upon a recognition of fact, but not a slavery to it. Okay? Which is why Tolkien says, 
You know, that subcreated world, that other world has to have things that are similar to this world. And he's going to talk a little bit about, you know, about the somewhat in escape. But the idea that, you know, for example, in most works of fantasy, they're set not in our world. They're set somewhere else. Okay? The Harry Potter stories kind of blur that a little bit because they start out in this world and then move to the Harry Potter world, which is kind of our world. Okay? Um... But what do we see portrayed? How many of you have read the Harry Potter novels, or at least some of them? Okay, you you see portrayed in that series of novels a variety of things that are very similar to this world. Correct. Give me an example. You have shops. Okay, you have shops. What else do you have? They're governing bodies. Governing You've got bodies. you know the Ministry of Magic. Okay. Like they've got Wizarding Wireless Network. They've got the Wizarding Wireless Network, etc. They have a couple bands that okay. come around and play that seem like... The Weird them. Sisters and, you know, things like that. What else do they have that is similar to our world that we really wouldn't really... That we would really rather we didn't have? Evil. What, evil, okay. You know, what do the Malfoys represent, if you want? Probably some sort of like corrupt upper class. Politicians. Okay. Um, they're not really politicians. They're just, the corruption of politicians. They're very well off and they have enough money to pay people off and get away with things. Okay, some people would say, I'm not, I'm not saying Thomas is doing this, some people would say, ah, oh, they represent the 1%, you know. Well, not, not Yeah, I know, that's why I said you're not really doing that. <laughs> they're racist. How that? How about that? They're Aryan. Because they don't like mudbloods. Because they're pure blooded and those people are better. Okay, they're Aryans. I mean, if you've seen the films, which I also detest, but if you've seen the films, you know Jason I Jason I does does a pretty good Lucius Malfoy. I say, long, straight, blonde hair, blue eyes, tall, slender. I mean, they're like uh, Legos, if you want, from the Lord of the Rings. Okay, but it's their attitude towards muggles towards non-wizarding people. It's their attitude towards house elves. It's their attitude towards goblins. It's their attitude towards giants or half-human, half-giants. It's their attitude even towards pure-blooded wizards who have different ideologies than them that shows their real inherent racism. Do we have that kind of real inherent racism in our world? Obviously. <coughs> Question? No, okay. I was catching a feather in my face. I'm seeing things. <laughs> um, okay, so when we experience that in an other world, in a literary setting, this is how we can get a regaining of a clear view here. Because if you were to just read about racism in this world, our world, what would it come across as? I think that the idea of fantasy is pretty much to show things in such an extreme light to where we can identify things in less of an extreme light so that way we can identify and hopefully help change the problem. If we see it in an other world setting, okay, but we don't experience it as we, as we experience it here. If we see it in another world setting and then we come back to our world, we kind of go like, oh, I get it. Okay, yeah. Well, that, when you read about that, it's like really dry. Like the Communist Manifesto, like no one wants to read Marx. <laughs> well, I don't know. I know some who do. <laughs> well, it's just so dry and boring. Like, people read it for a purpose, not to necessarily, like, catch up on. Or let's use a better example. Not for funsies. Um, no one wants to read Nietzsche. Okay. You're right. But, to some extent, you don't have to read Nietzsche if you read the Harry Potter story. Because the Harry Potter stories are full 
of Nietzschean language. The whole will to power is, is right there from the first novel all the way through the end. Okay? Am I saying that you don't need to read Nietzsche? No, I'm not. But what I am saying is to understand what Nietzsche is talking about, you can read the Harry Potter stories and get a, uh, a more personal grasp, let's say, of this idea that, let me paraphrase what Quirrell tells Harry at the end of the first novel. You know, I was a foolish man, he says, when I traveled the world and I met my master. And he says, my master taught me many things. There is no such thing as good and evil. There is only power and those too weak to seek it. Okay. That could have come straight out of the mouth of Nietzsche. <clears throat> could also have come out of the mouth of Hitler. It's not an accident that J.K. Rowling does that. Why? Because she wants us to see, by experiencing it in that other world, that's real here. Do we have the word mudblood in our daily lexicon? No. We have nigger. That's what it means. Okay. If you're a member of the, you know, Aryan nation or some other, some other idiotic skinhead racist group. And every now and then I tell myself, well, I ought to be careful about saying things like that. Because I had a student one year, <laughs> my first year teaching here, who linked together. There's a nice little triumvirate. He linked together. Hitler. Stalin. Take a guess. An American president for the third one. Bush. Lincoln. Okay. This guy was from, you know, common, the uh, Tidewater area of Virginia. I mean, we're talking old southern blood, and he was talking about, you know, the war of northern aggression. I'm not, okay. Okay. Um, but you can experience what is being talked about in that other world here. Okay? So Tolkien goes on about recovery. He says, um, the things that we've appropriated, legally or mentally, we say we know them. <laughs> they have become like the things which once attracted us by their glitter, or their color, or their shape. And we laid hands on them, and then locked them in our hoard, acquired them, and acquiring ceased to look at them. Okay. I don't need to look at my best friend. Why? I know who he or she is. Period. I put them in their little box. And then what happens when the little box gets destroyed? <laughs> or they die. And I no longer get to see them. Because I didn't actually acquire them. I didn't actually appropriate them. They were still free, unique individuals and such. Okay? That's what Tolkien wants us to do. See with new eyes. So he goes on and he talks about other kinds of recovery, or he uses a new word, a prophylactic against loss. Humility is enough. Okay? And so he goes on and talks about humility and such. And then he leads from there into escape and consolation. And so he says, I now conclude, even though he doesn't really, I now conclude by considering escape and consolation, which are naturally closely connected. Though fairy stories are, of course, by no means the only medium of escape, they are today one of the most obvious and, to some, outrageous forms of escapist literature. So he says, I have to deal first, head on, with this charge of escapism. Oh, you just want to escape from reality. Oh, you're going to go see Star Wars. That's just escapist. Or you're going to watch. That's just escapism. Grow up and deal with your problems. Okay? So Tolkien says, Obviously, since I said escape is one of the main functions of fairy stories, I almost think it's a good thing. And a lot of people don't. 
So it says we have to discuss what we actually mean by escape. In what the misusers, with the people who say bad things about escape, in what the misusers are fond of calling real life, escape is evidently, as a rule, very practical. It may even be heroic. In real life, it is difficult to blame it, unless it fails. Okay? In criticism, it would seem to be the worse, the better it succeeds. So, why should a man be scorned if finding himself in prison, he tries to get out and go home? I mean, wouldn't escape there be a good thing? Okay? And he talks about the difference between the escape of the prisoner versus the flight of the deserter. Okay? And he doesn't say the escape of the wrongly imprisoned prisoner. Because I think everybody would say, well, yeah, obviously that person ought to try and escape. But what is the difference between the deserter and the prisoner? What does the deserter have to do? What's the deserter? Okay, it's always a military context. What is the deserter's job? Before running away, let me put it that way. To stay in fight. To stay in fight. In other words, he has a responsibility. He has a duty to do. Some kind of action to perform. So why is he deserting? Because he doesn't want to fight. I don't want to. <laughs> or I'm afraid. Okay. So how is that different than the escape of the prisoner? This prisoner is held against his will. The prisoner is held against his will. Have any of you ever seen the film? I never remember the name of this thing. I think it was Instinct. Cuba Gooding Jr., Anthony Hopkins, you know the one I'm talking about? Where Cuba Gooding Jr. plays a uh, psychiatrist. Anthony Hopkins is this world-famous anthropologist who studies apes. And he goes off to Africa, and he studies apes, and he lives with the apes. I mean, sheds his clothes, lives like an ape, you know, the full Tarzan kind of deal. Okay? And this all comes out through flashback. He lives with the apes, and while he's living with the apes, and identifying and becoming welcomed into the ape troop, her, whatever you call them. Um, these poachers come in and start killing the gorillas. And he, I mean, he just goes berserk. He kills a couple of the poachers and um, harms other ones. And he eventually gets arrested and gets sent back to the United States. This is to Florida. And what Cuba Gooding Jr. has got to do is he's got to try and help him get to be sane enough so that he, he can go to trial, I guess, so that he can, can be killed. Um, and so, you know, most of the film is him going and having these conversations with Anthony Hopkins' character. And you get this one beautiful scene where he goes to, I think it is, he goes to Hopkins' cell. And his cell's, you know, a little six by six or eight by eight cell. And the walls are all painted. And they're just painted with leaves all over. Why? Because by painting the cell to look like the jungle, it's his way of saying, you can put me in a cell, but you can't control me up here. That's his way of escape. The argument could be made, is he properly in jail? Who knows? Doesn't really matter. But he is doing what he can to escape. Okay? Now look at what Tolkien asked again. If a man is in prison, why should a man be scorned if he tries to get out and go home? Now extrapolate from there to here. What if 
you view life or your situation as a prison? What if life's so hard that you need a break? And we don't have one. And so you, you know, plop yourself down in front of the TV or a film or a novel and you quote unquote escape for a while. Give your nerves, your body, your soul time to recharge. Okay. It's the difference between that and the deserter. What would the deserter do in the case of if this were just life that got to be so bad? Like if I didn't do my homework and I decided to watch a movie instead, but then did my homework after the movie instead of just dropping out of school. Okay, it'd be more of the dropping out of school. Yeah. Or how do you drop out of if everything gets to be too much? Suicide. Notice the distinction. Or you shoot up a movie theater first, and then pretend my opinion. <laughs> pretend you're crazy. Okay. So. Tolkien says, there's a lot of things we want to escape from, right? I mean, towards the end of the semester, you're going to have papers due, and most of you are English majors. You're going to have ton of papers to do. You're going to want to escape from those. You're going to try a variety of means to escape from those. Okay? It might be a liquid means. It might be, you know, a pill mean. It might be, you know... Variety of things, okay? Does that mean that impending deadline will never come? No. Don't try the extreme means, please. Talk to me if you get that bad, okay? <laughs> we'll work something out. <laughs> but that's minor. What about, you know, no job? What about no food? Hunger? problem with hunger is you always have it with you. you. You can never, if you've been hungry. And I don't mean, you know, oh, I haven't eaten in eight hours. I'm hungry. I mean, if you've been constantly hungry for weeks or months on end, it doesn't go away. Even in your sleep, you're hungry. Okay? That's one of the little escapes Tolkien talks about. What else? Sorrow. Is a thing people would like to do away with. I mean, um, Aldous Huxley wrote a whole novel in 1930 that is largely based upon this idea. Let's escape from real life. Papa Soma. Go off to the reservation. Take a look, you know, go to the feelies of films. And escape for a while, even though in his world there's really nothing to escape from. Because what problems are there, really, in Oceana of Brave New World? There's no problems. But for us, there are. Oceana, Oceana that's 1984. The one world state yeah, in Brave yeah, New there's, World. Yeah, what, there's nothing, uh, what was it, the, Dave, the Talking Head song, Heaven is a Place Where Nothing Ever Happens. The brave new world is a place where nothing ever happens. Exactly. Exactly. Which is why, if you've not read Brave New World, I really encourage you to do it. If for no other reason, to get to the very end where Mustafa Mond is talking with um, John about pain and sorrow. And John's saying, I want there to be pain. There needs to be pain. There need to be tears. And Mustafa Mond's like, why? We can get completely away from all of that, okay? But Tolkien talks about other things to escape from, okay? Now, keep in mind, he's a very solid traditionalist. He's even more conservative than I am in, in some ways. Actually, Tolkien called himself an anarchist, <laughs> okay? He probably just went up in some of your estimations. Because he didn't like things like automobiles and trains, Hated technology. Hated technology. Even though he lived by it. He, he didn't, you know, have candles in his house. Okay. 
He wrote with a pen, that's technology, and a pencil, that's technology. He didn't, you know, go, you know, write in dirt. <laughs> kind of hard to take dirt to a publisher. Okay? But he does then go on to talk about other things, such as, as I said, hunger and, and things like that. All right? And then he mentions, you know, the great escape. What is it everybody, seemingly, or many people, let's say, try to escape from? Death. Death. What does Voldemort's name mean? Will of death? No, close. Uh, no, no, flight from death. Flight from death. Vol comes from Latin volo, or volare, to fly. De means out mort death, to fly from death. He wants to escape death at any expense. Okay? Well, do people today? Yes. How do you know? Where do you see it around you? Plastic surgery? Botox? Botox? Surgeries. Variety of other surgeries? Hair transplants? Okay. Or all means of trying to say, hey, look, I'm still young. I mean, do a Google search of Bruce Jenner. <laughs> and look at a recent image of Bruce Jenner in Bruce Jenner in 1976. When he won the Olympic decathlon. Okay? He's trying to look like he did in 1976. What his face is all like this. And you know, you wonder how he can even smile because its skin's gotta be so tight. Bart Durham's a scary one too. <laughs> Local real uh, lawyer guy. The lawyer guy, yeah. I mean oh, yeah. I mean he looked that way when I was in high school, except not so supernatural. <laughs> Right. I mean, a lot of actors. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay, or Stallone, or, you know, Mickey Rourke. Look at Mickey Rourke. Man, you talk about a rough life. <laughs> okay? We want to escape death. What other kinds of things do we want to escape? They don't all have to be bad. How many of you have ever dreamed, I mean literally, you know, dreamed of flying? It's totally cool, right? I mean, it's just, you know, however you do it, you know, I remember lots of dreams where I'm like swimming through the air. And I'm, you know, I wake up I'm like, no, just once, you know. What's that an example of? Our own little puny physical limitations. I can't jump like Michael Jordan. I can't run like Usain Bolt. Okay? I can't sing like whoever. I can't write like whoever. I can't. Okay? Those are all little limitations that if I were God, I would say, no, you could do that. You could do that. Okay? Little limitations we'd like to be able to escape from. Okay? Think of the Lord of the Rings for a moment. Frodo is a little miniature person. <laughs> He's a hobbit. And nowhere, by the way, in the Lord of the Rings does you know, Galadriel say, oh, it's time for the little people to do great things. The, the uh, stuff in the film. <laughs> Tolkien's never as trait as that. Okay? But what do we see? One person. Today it becomes trait in, in politics. One person can make a difference. We don't tend to think that, but it's an example of it, okay? We should think that way, though, if you know how the Supreme Court works and how court states work, it's one person usually. All of those things, and it just gets built up, and it's still from one person. I mean, John Roberts. Let's use a recent court case, Obamacare. Okay? Everybody thought left and right of the political realm, 
that whatever side Scalia, Alito, and Thomas went on, John Roberts would be right there in quote-unquote lockstep. Why do they use the word lockstep? Like they're Nazis goose-stepping on a log. Okay? But who was it? It was Alito, Thomas, Scalia, and Kennedy. The one who's the not so, uh, what's the word I want? Not so sure bet on the quote unquote conservative coalition. He kind of goes back and forth. Kennedy was the one making the strongest case for why Obamacare ought to be thrown out. And Roberts, my opinion, my opinion. Roberts, through some amazing mental gymnastics, said, no, it needs to be upheld because he interpreted what Congress did not according to what Congress did. He called it a tax. Did Congress ever call it a tax? No, but he said it's a tax, even though Congress never uses that language of it being a tax. Okay? So that's kind of an example there. So he talks about the biggest escape, the greatest escape, the escape from death. Lord of the Rings, we have that escape from death. They're called elves. Can they be killed? Yes. Will they die naturally? No. They just keep on going. They're like animate Timex watches. You never have to wind them up. They just keep going. Does that mean as they go on and on, their lives get richer, fuller, more beautiful, more full? No. No, just the opposite, in fact. They, they get less and less the longer they go. Okay? So he says, now it's time to bring up consolation. Because death is the thing we ultimately need consolation from. So he says, the consolation of fairy tales has another aspect than the imaginative satisfaction of ancient desires. That Satisfaction of ancient desires. That's part of what he's talking about in the escape. You know, like um, wanting to talk to other living things that aren't people. How many of you have pets? How many of you would love to be able to talk to your pet and hear your pet talk back? That would be so awesome. The movie Up was great with the collars. <laughs> okay. That's exactly our 100-pound right. our black lab, Remus, who I'm convinced was born without a brain, Okay, I would love to talk with and Beowulf before he died. I would have loved to talk with our cat Fluffy, not so much. <laughs> She's a cat, and it'd be all about her. <laughs> okay, <laughs> trees. I'm from California, I've been around 2,000 year old redwoods. I would love to be able to Your woods talk to a tree that's been around a long time. Okay. So he says, there's, however, other more important desires, far more important than the imaginative satisfaction of ancient desires, is the consolation of the happy ending. What does he mean by happy ending? The Disney princess and the prince see their castle off in the clouds and they ride off to it? No. No. Almost I would venture to assert that all complete fairy stories must have it. That is, must have not the happy ending, the consolation of the happy ending. He says, I would say tragedy is the true form of drama. Okay? Meaning, every real drama has built within it tragedy. Even if it's something like A Midsummer Night's Dream, or As You Like It, or Much Ado About Nothing, every one of Shakespeare's romantic comedies, usually somewhere during Act Three, could easily become the tragedy. The tragedies don't as easily turn into comedies. It's kind of hard to think of a way that Hamlet becomes, and they all live happily ever after. You know, where Hamlet marries Ophelia, and Laertes, I don't know, does something else. And, right? Is very okay. 
So he It'd says, be funnier if he did. it would be funnier if he did. So he says, as tragedy is the true form of drama, the opposite is true of fairy stories. So what's the opposite of tragedy? It's not comedy, which is why Tolkien says, we don't have a word that expresses this opposite. So I'm going to make one. You catastrophe. Now, everybody knows what that word means, right? Catastrophe. Somebody define it. A disastrous occurrence. A disastrous occurrence. No. It's not what a catastrophe is. It is literally, this word means turn, and the kata means sudden or quick. It's a quick or sudden turn or change of events. But through usage, it does mean disastrous. A disastrous turn or change of events. But literally, that's not what it means. Okay? If somebody walked in the store right now and handed me a check that was good, <laughs> that was valid, let's say, for $10 million, that would be a catastrophe. It would be a sudden change of events. It's not something I'm really expecting. Okay? Whether or not it would be a you catastrophe or a this catastrophe would largely depend upon me. Okay? The you catastrophe is the sudden good turn of events. But it might not always appear good to the individual whose events are turning. Or to put it another way, it might not, at the moment of the change, appear as good. That it is a good turn may not become known until later. Okay? Pretty important distinction. So Tolkien says, the you catastrophic tale is the true form of fairy tale. So the tale that has this sudden good change. I'm going to read an entire paragraph. The consolation of fairy stories, the joy of the happy ending, or more correctly, of the good catastrophe, the sudden joyous turn, big parentheses here, for there is no true end to any fairy tale. Why? They keep going on. You merely turn the page, and part of the tale ends, but the tale still goes on. He says, this joy, which is one of the things which fairy stories can produce supremely well, is not essentially escapist nor fugitive. It's not a means of saying, oh, things aren't so bad in the world. Just believe and they'll be okay. Just believe and they'll be okay. No. In its fairy tale or other world setting, the youth catastrophic term, it is a sudden and miraculous grace, never to be counted on to recur. You know, that's religious language. It's grace. It is something given from somebody else, and the person or the people who receive it don't receive it because of anything they've done. They don't earn it, in other words. Okay? It, the U catastrophic turn, does not, does not deny the existence of discatastrophe, the bad turn. Tolkien spells it with a Y. Okay. Of sorrow and failure. Why? Because the possibility of these, the possibility of sorrow and failure, is necessary to the joy of deliverance. Now think about that. You have to have the possibility to fail 
in order to really appreciate what? Success. The joy of success. Okay. Would it mean, yeah, I shouldn't ask this because <laughs> I'll probably get an answer I don't want. Would it really mean as much to you if you all came in here first day of class and said, okay, everybody has earned an A? Yes. I mean, yeah, you'd be glad your GPA go up, whatever. But would it mean as much? No. no. Probably not. Okay. Would it mean as much if I said everybody's got an F and you, there's nothing you can do about it? There'd be a lot of drops. <laughs> Okay. No, when the outcome is guaranteed, then it's kind of hard to feel one way or the other. So, it does not deny the existence of discatastrophe, of sorrow and failure, the possibility of these is necessary to the joy of deliverance. But what does it do? It denies, in the face of much evidence, if you will, universal final defeat. And insofar is evangelium. Nice Greek word. What's it mean? <clears throat> Good news. More religious language. Evangelium, like the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the gospel writers. It denies universal final defeat and insofar is evangelium, giving a fleeting glimpse of Joy, and this time he capitalizes the word. Previously, when he used joy, it was lowercase. Joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant as grief. So what does he mean? How many of you have read Beowulf? I mean, okay, let me back that up for a minute. How many of you have read the real Beowulf? I mean, not the one like you might have had like an AP English class in high school or whatever, which is back, bastardized, horrible version. Okay. I know you have because you had it with me. Okay. I mean the real poem and all of it. Okay. What Tolkien is talking about is you've got to have the possibility of utter failure. And you've got to, in fact, have a, a situation where it looks like all of the odds say you're going to lose. You're going to die. There's nothing you can do to stop that. In order to get that you catastrophe, that turn, that suddenly makes you think, oh, what he's going to call that aha, that lifting of the heart. Okay, let me give you an example from Lord of the Rings. I don't even remember if this is in the film version. I don't think I ever actually watched all the third film. At the Battle of Pelennor Fields, towards the kind of the end of, I think, book three, meaning um, Return of the King, you got this big battle going on outside Minas Tirith. And things aren't going well. Okay? You do have the Witch King of Angmar get killed by Eowyn and, and some other things happen. But then people suddenly see the Black Corsairs of Umbar, which are essentially pirate ships, is what they think of. Black sails come out. Okay? At that point, when you hear the Corsairs of Umbar, you're meant to think, more, even more enemy are arriving. And then what happens? What gets unfurled from the masts of these ships? The ghosts. Aragorn just goes down. Well, the ghosts are gone because the ghosts are when able to Aragorn and his men to take the ships. Okay. This is after all that. The banner of the house of Numenor. The banner of the house of Numenor. Aragorn unveils his flag. It's like the stars and stripes shining, you know, and they're like, whoa, did they expect that? Not at all. The battle was going very poorly. Okay. Or the battle before the Black Gates. You got roughly seven to 10,000 
people representing the free people of Middle Earth against a bazillion. <laughs> you know, just tens and tens of thousands coming out of Mordor. It's not looking good. And all of a sudden, the big black gates fall to the ground. Why? The ring's been destroyed. The power of Sauron is gone. Okay? You don't expect it to happen. And yet it does. And Tolkien says what that does is it gives a fleeting glimpse of joy. Joy beyond the confines of this world. Well, what does that mean? It means that this world isn't all that there is. It's joy that comes from outside this world and creeps in or it's like the veil gets lifted just a little bit and you see this bright light shining through. Tolkien does that several times in The Lord of the Rings. You're going to see when we get to it. Frodo and Sam, they're plodding on along through Mordor and suddenly they're going to see the light of a star way off in the distance. And that's going to be just enough to lift Sam's spirits, to enable him to go a little bit farther. Okay? It's a little eucatastrophe. So, Tolkien says about the eucatastrophe, it is the mark of a good fairy story of the higher or more complete kind. That however wild its events, However fantastic or terrible the adventures, it can give to child or man that hears it, when the turn comes, a catch of the breath, a beat and lifting of the heart, near to or perhaps accompanied by tears, as keen as that given by any form of literary art and having a peculiar quality. And he says, even modern fairy stories can produce this effect sometimes. And I kind of think he's probably thinking of The Hobbit when he says that. Okay. But where is there an example of, of that kind of eucatastrophe? Let's say not in Tolkien. Give me an example in a modern fairy story. And we got all kinds of modern fairy stories. They might not be written. They oh, might be visual. Yeah, Star Wars. Which one? Any of them. No, let, let's say uh, New Hope. I know when Luke finds out that uh, Vader's his father, I think that's a... That's a, that's a Is that a you catastrophe for Luke at that moment? That's a dis... That's a dis I mean... But it helps him out later because it, it gives him the, it gives the whole rebel cause of the upper edge. Okay, so go then to then the original it's third it's film. Right. Return of the Jedi. And what happens? Vader kills the Emperor. Luke tells him. It's, I think it's the, probably the best of them, in my opinion. Luke tells him, there is still good in you, Father. I can sense the conflict. I can feel it. And what does Darth Vader tell him? You're wrong. You stupid kid. You're full of nonsense. No. He says, it is too late for me. What does that not mean? It doesn't mean you're wrong. In other words, when he says, it's too late for me, he's not saying, you're wrong. There is no good in me. I'm rotten through and through. Okay? Yeah, he's basically just saying, if you understood this dark side shit, then yeah. You wouldn't try to turn me. Yeah. Okay. But he doesn't say it's not existing. Exactly. So, which is why when later on Luke is battling the Emperor, or actually being zapped by the Emperor, he goes, Father, Father, help me, you know. <laughs> and you see Darth Vader look back and forth. Real flaw in the storytelling, by the way, here. Because if the Emperor is, quote unquote, you know, supposedly so nearly all powerful, how come Darth Vader can lift him up and the Emperor doesn't do anything? I, I mean, why doesn't he, you know, turn the tables or look at Darth, you know? He's so taken by the catastrophe. Yeah, he's so taken by his anger. He's so full of the dark, you know, all that kind of nonsense. 
But he's okay. kind of old, too. He's kind of old people. You know, he has power. I mean, he's physically. Yeah. Is he old and feeble? Well, he also has some implants, too. I mean, he's got the weird, you know, lizard face or whatever, but I don't know. Um, but you see there, I mean, that's the you catastrophic ending. When Darth Vader picks him up, throws him down. Okay. And then later on, you know, Luke, he talks to Luke and says, you know, you were right, son, blah, blah, blah. In other words, he gets his redemption and we sing songs to Jesus and everything, everything all fine. Okay. That's the, the lifting of the heart, the catch of the breath. Even modern fairy stories can produce this effect. Where do you see that in Harry Potter? Or do you? I would say you do. Yeah. I mean, when he finds out Sirius, like, didn't betray his parents when he gets the story from Sirius. Okay. And he figures out that he's going a little serious instead of the Dursleys, which doesn't really work out still. I mean, there are little you catastrophes throughout books one through seven. Yeah. Okay. There's a big one in seven. The big one for me is Snape. When he learns everything from Snape. When he learns everything from Snape. When he goes to quote unquote King's Cross. I don't even, I've not seen the seventh film, so I don't know if it's in there. But in the book, when he's killed by Voldemort and he wakes up and he's in King's Cross and he's naked and he realizes, oh, I'm naked. And he suddenly is clothes. Okay, and then he meets Dumbledore and they start to chat and everything and he's given a choice you can go on or you can go back well what's on? don't know <laughs> you have to go to find out okay. or you can go back and he decides to go back that's not I mean that's part of the eucatastrophe where's the real eucatastrophe? what does Luke, uh, Luke what does what is his name? Harry never do in any of the books what does he never try to do kill to anybody? Anyone. To kill anyone. Not once. Okay. What does he offer Voldemort? In the book, I've been told it doesn't happen in the film. A chance to repent. A chance to repent. Come on, be a man, he says. Feel some remorse. Why does he give him that chance? If you've read the books. Well, it's because he saw the little baby at King's Crossing. He saw the, the piece of Voldemort's baby. soul. Yeah, the one pure bit. That's baby. horrible and maimed and ugly and scabby. And, bleh. and he says, I've seen the real you. What's he offering? You can be whole again. But you have to, you know, it's going to be hard. you got to be sorry for what you've done. Okay? So, Tolkien goes from there. To his epilogue. He says, The joy which I've selected as the mark of the true fairy story, or romance, or as the root seal upon it, merits more consideration. What is this joy? And he links it to the story found in the Gospels. He links it to the incarnation. What? I mean, this guy's supposed to be an academic. He's not supposed to be talking about Jesus. Okay? He says the Gospels contain a fairy story. Excuse me. Or a story of a larger kind which embraces all the essence of fairy stories. They, fairy stories, contain many marvels. Per peculiarly artistic, beautiful, and moving. Mythical in their perfect self-contained significance. He says the Gospels do the same thing with this little caveat. They claim to be true. In other words, they claim to be myth, yet true myth. Okay? So why is he going off into this tangent? Relates to this phrase. Which I'll explain that in just a moment. Tolkien says at the end of the essay, Um, the joy that you see in a fairy story or in a fairy story looks forward or backward the direction is unimportant to the great eucatastrophe 
The Christian joy, the Gloria, is of the same kind, but it is preeminently high in joyance. This story is supreme, and it is true. Art has been verified. God is the Lord of angels and of men and of elves. Huh? And, you know, pick up your King James and, you know, look in the back in the concordance and find elf. Hobbit, dwarf, you know, Balrog. They're not there. Legend and history have met and fused. In God's kingdom, the presence of the greatest does not depress the small. Redeemed man is still man. Meaning, go back to the beginning, or back to the passage where he's talking about, we make because we're made in the image of a maker. Redeemed man is still man. That is, he's still a maker. He's still a sub-creator. He's still, Tolkien seems to be playing, for example, in heaven, people are still going to be making up stories. Breathing lives through silver, lives through silver. Story, fantasy, still go on. The Evangelium has not abrogated legends. That is, the gospel doesn't say, oh, that's all untrue, that's unimportant. You don't need to read any of that. All you need to do is read the Bible. So go get rid of all your books. Only, only read Bibles. Take, take the Bible to every one of your classes and just tell your person. No. Tolkien is saying. No. What has it done? It, the Evangelium, the good news, has hallowed them. That is, all stories. It has taken all stories and raised them up. Or to use language that C.S. Lewis might use, it baptized them. Does it mean all stories are quote-unquote Christian stories? No. You know, you can't read of mice and men and say, oh, yeah, I get it. Uh, Lenny's Jesus, and I can't remember the name. George. George is, uh, or George is Jesus, and, you know, Lenny's Judas, because what does he do? He takes him off in the woods and offs him, you know. <laughs> Not what it means. It has hallowed them, especially the happy ending. The Christian has still to work with mind as well as body to suffer, hope, and die. But he may now perceive that all his bents and faculties have a purpose which can be redeemed. Who's Tolkien talking to? I mean, the original form of the address is given to a, a, a group of university students and faculty, St. Andrews University in St. Andrews, Scotland. I think he's talking to himself. I think he is entirely writing to himself. Because what is he working on while he's writing and developing this essay? He's already published The Hobbit. About 49 when he did the reading? 39. When he revised this He revised it in 47, publishes it in 47. All right, so he's way into MMTR. Right? He's way into the Lord of the Rings by the time he revises it. Even in 38, 39, he's already begun writing the Lord of the Rings. He has set aside, kind of, because he never really set it all the way aside. He has set aside... The Silmarillion, the stories that will later get published as the Silmarillion. And he's writing the sequel to The Hobbit. Okay? Who's he writing it for? He doesn't know yet. Who is he writing these stories for? These stories that will not get published in his lifetime. He asks his closest friends, after The Hobbit is published... What he should work on next? Should he keep working on this or this sequel idea? And they say, give it up. <laughs> Nobody's going to want to read this. Because, as Tolkien says, it is linguistic in origin. All of the stories in here are all for one purpose. To give a history and background to the languages that he created. You know, Nobody's going to be interested in that, they told him. Follow up. Do the Lord of the Rings. Okay. 
So I think he's telling himself, all the time I'm spending on this is not wasted. Even this, or even Lord of the Rings, will be hallowed somehow. Okay? This phrase, quid hineldus cum Christo. It is a question that was written by Alcuin of York, okay, famous medieval priest and preacher who served at the court of Charlemagne. He was a man from northern England who Charlemagne recruited to be his headmaster of his essentially um, palace school at Aachen in Germany. And he wrote this. around sometime in the 790s, okay? He sent this letter back to a group of monks in England because word had reached him that these monks are spending their dinner time listening to heroic tales, heroic stories of Ingeld at the dinner table at the refectory, where typically in monastic fashion, while everybody else would be eating, you would have one brother stand up and it would read either from scripture or from lives of the saints or something holy and edifying. And what are they doing? They got somebody standing up and reading Beowulf, essentially, okay? I mean, Beowulf is one of the, one of the places that, that we know of in Gilt. So he writes a letter back and says, what does Ingo have to do with Christ? You guys are monks for Pete's sake. You should be hearing about Jesus. You know, to paraphrase the, the prayer of St. Patrick, Jesus before me, Jesus behind me, Jesus beside me, Jesus beside me, Jesus above me, Jesus below me, Jesus in front of me, Jesus you know, in back of me. Jesus ahead, Jesus below, Jesus in my food, Jesus in my breath, Jesus in the water. Everything's Jesus. Okay? And he's saying, so what's Ingeld, good Germanic pagan hero, have to do with Jesus? I think Tolkien is telling us. Ingeld, as an aspect of story, can give us that fleeting glimpse. In other words, I think Tolkien is saying, even in something like Beowulf, you can get that, I'm going to use a small e, Evangelium. You can get that glimpse of joy that's from beyond the confines of this world. Okay? Just like you can in Lord of the Rings, just like you can in um, Harry Potter, Star Wars, take your pick, okay? So, and then he gives us a bunch of notes, which I don't want to um, go into. So he says at the very end, his last two sentences, last sentence, all tales may come true. Okay? All tales, he says, maybe works so that at the end they may come true. And yet, at the last redeemed, redeemed, what does he mean? He means this tale, or this group of tales, will, like humanity, be redeemed. What does that mean? Made whole, made well, made and whole and well, have particular meanings. They mean perfect. Okay? So all tales may be redeemed. They may be, and at the last, that is, when they are redeemed, they may be as like and as unlike the forms that we give them as man finally redeemed will be like and unlike the fallen that we know. C.S. Lewis said in a famous sermon that he delivered in um, either 1944 or 1945 
titled The Weight of Glory. He said, every person you meet right now is something that later on, if you were to meet them when you are dead, that is, in their final stage, they would be either a god or goddess that you would fall down before and worship, or something so horrifyingly scary you would flee as fast as you can. Okay? What's he talking about? He's talking about, you know, where people end up, heaven or hell kind of a thing. Tolkien's using the same kind of language. He's saying the story can be as like or unlike what? As the forms that we give them now. Poetry, short story, novel, drama. Redeemed, this thing can be so utterly transformed that we wouldn't even recognize it now. Transformed for the better. <laughs> or unredeemed the other way. Okay? Now, keep all that in mind. Like I said the other day, um, Skip the Beowulf essay for a moment because we'll talk about it as we go through The Hobbit and such. We're not going to talk about all of this, even though I know we've got three days to sign. I'm going to try and um, do what I want to do in this in two days. And I want to begin where it begins, with the Anulan Dalek, okay? which is what? The Anulan Dalek is Tolkien's telling of what? Creation. Creation. Okay. <clears throat> Notice how similar it is to his Catholic belief system. And so we begin with Iru, the one, okay, who in Arda is called Iluvatar. And he made first the Ainur, the holy ones, that were the offspring of his thought. They were with him before aught else was made. And he spoke to them, and he gives them themes of music, okay, to the Ainur. And they sang before him. In other words, he plants the themes in their minds and they sing. And he's glad. And for a long while, each one sang alone. That is, you know, you have one over here off singing his own little tune. And another one over here off singing his own little tune. And they're all singing individually. And Iru likes it. And why do they each only sing individually? Go back to that little snippet of poem that Tolkien included in the fairy story essay. Where he says, each is a splintered part of the whole. Because each of the Ainur sees only that little bit that Aru put into their minds. Okay? For each comprehended only that part of the mind of Luvatar from which he came. And in the understanding of their brethren, they grew but slowly. But Iluvatar calls them all together, and he gives them all a mighty theme. Okay, I want you to stop singing, you know, it's a small world after all, individually, in different keys and all that kind of, I want, I've, I've got this big, you know, Beethoven's fifth. I want you to work on together. And so he gives it to them. And we're told, this theme unfolding to them things greater and more wonderful than he had yet revealed. The glory of its beginning and the splendor of its end amazed the Ainur, so that they bowed before Iluvatar and were silent. And so he says, okay, now, I've given you the theme, make in harmony together a great music. And since I have kindled you with the flame imperishable, you shall show forth your powers in adorning this theme, each with his own thoughts and devices, if he will. The flame imperishable means, probably, he has given them some creative abilities. So, you know, go create. Add to the theme what is unique or peculiar to you. 
right? And he says, I'll sit by and listen. And so they start to sing. And notice their voices were like what? Harps and vials and trumpets and lutes and pipes and organs and blah, 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 blah. Why does he say they were like that? Because they weren't. Physical things. Yeah, the Ainur do not have physical bodies. In order to have a trumpet, you have to, have a, you know, something to do the little vibration. Okay, so they sing, and Luvatar sits there and he likes it because there's no flaws. But as the theme progressed, this one I knew at singular, named Melkor starts weaving in some of his own ideas. Well, he was told to, okay? But how was he told to weave in ideas? Things that go along with the theme. And so you got this nice music going along, and then Melkor kind of starts, <laughs> rhythm, you know, starts doing that. And Iru doesn't like it so much, okay? Then Iluvatar rose, and the Ainur pursue, perceived that he smiled, and he lifts up his left hand. And a new theme starts amid the storm. The storm that has begun because of Iru's theme and Melkor trying to overtake it. So now Iru stands up, smiles, lifts up his hand. A new theme comes in, washes over. But the discord of Melkor rose in uproar and contended with it. Then again, Iluvatar arose. And now he's not smiling. His countenance was stern. He lifts up his right hand. And behold, a third theme amid the confusion. And it was unlike the others. For it seemed at first soft and sweet, a mere rippling. And now there's this great, you know, battle of the music. The one was deep and wide and beautiful, but slow and blended with an immeasurable sorrow from which its beauty chiefly came. The other had now achieved a unity of its own, but it was loud and vain and endlessly repeated. Here's, you know, top 40 music. Same thing over and over and over and over. Okay? And in the midst of all this, finally, Luvatar arose, and he raises both hands. One chord deeper than the abyss, higher than the firmament, piercing as the light of the eye of Luvatar, and the music stops. So what do we have being depicted? Okay, creation. What else? Conflict between Satan and God and Satan. Conflict between good and evil. God and Satan, if you will. Is there really a conflict between God and Satan? Not yet. Not really. I mean, according to kind of classical Christian dogma, you know, God's up here. We're Satan. <laughs> Uncreated, eternal, the whole nine yards. Created and could, you know, you know, gone. Okay? The conflict is ultimately, it's between more like Satan and Michael. So... Iluvatar speaks. Mighty are the Ainur, and mightiest among them is Melkor. But that he may know, and all the Ainur, I'm saying this for the benefit of all of you, that I am Iluvatar. <laughs> That's his way of saying, I'm God, you're not. And I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to show you what you've sung. Oh, you didn't realize? You weren't just singing? What were they actually doing when they were singing? What did they create? The world is. Everything, exactly. The universe and all that are in it. Okay? From beginning to end. All Universal history. It's done. Okay? Let your mind wrap around that for a moment. So, he says, 
Thou, Melchor, shalt see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me. That means the theme that Melchor tried to weave into Eru's theme comes ultimately from where? From Eru. Why? Because he comes from Eru. Okay? So ultimately, is there any problem of evil? No. The only reason there is evil is because, first and foremost, God exists. Period. Within the Lord of the Rings realm and kind of, again, traditional Christian dogma. Because what is evil? It's a negation. It's an absence. Okay? So, nor can any alter the, the music in my display. For he that attempteth this shall prove but my instrument in the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself hath not imagined. Notice what kind of language Jeru speaks. King James. Okay? So what has he just told them? No matter what you do, I will turn it for good. You can pretty much not read anything else after that. Because no matter all the conflict, no matter all the opposition, no matter all the death, all the despair, all the dying, Eru has just said, ultimately, none can alter the music in my despite. My will will be done. So the Ainu are afraid. They didn't understand. Melkor is filled with shame. Aruvatar rose in splendor. He went forth from the fair regions he had made for the Ainur. He comes to the void. He says, behold your music. And what do they see? They see a vision. They saw a new world made visible before them, globed amid the void. And then Aruvatar says, look at your music. This is your minstrelsy. Each of you shall find contained herein amid the design that I set before you all those things which it may seem that he himself devised or added. And thou, Melkor, wilt discover all the secret thoughts of thy mind, and wilt perceive that they are but a part of the whole and tributary to its glory. All the evil, in other words, you designed, will do what? Will add to the overall glory of this vision. Okay. So what are all the parts and things? If you've read some of the rest, the, um, the Vala Quinta, which is kind of the discussion of the backgrounds of each of the gods and all that kind of stuff. If you read that, you have gods <coughs> that are in charge of varieties of things. You have you know, plant and vegetation gods, you have weather gods, you have water gods, etc. So when they sang, when those Ainur sang, they sang those kinds of things. Okay? So you have Varda, who queen of the stars, who does the stars. Then you have uh, Vanya or something like that, who does the trees. Then you have uh, Ulmo, who loves water. So you have waterfalls and oceans. Okay? Uh, Tulkas, I think it is, the hunter. And so you have hunters and everything. The whole nine yards. And so they look in this picture and they go, oh, look, that's mine. <laughs> what does Melkor see? Oh, look, death. <laughs> that's mine. Look, there's somebody uh, born with cancer. That's mine. <laughs> there's agony, despair, hatred. Mine. <laughs> okay. But what does Uru say? All of that. So how is Aru looking at all of this? He's out here, separate from it, okay. and he's a bird's eye view. And he presents it to them from his perspective, so they see the bird's eye view. Okay. So that he sees the beginning to the end like in the blink of an eye, in an instant. Okay. I'll talk more as the semester goes about Boethius, 
because this is a very Boethian idea. Okay? Um, let's stop there. So about page seven.